Well, thank you for those great songs of worship, those Christmas themes. In fact, the song that we just sang, Hark the Herald Angels Sings, I remember the first time I heard that as a believer. I've heard it a long time, a lot of times prior to that, but <clears throat> when I heard that as a, as a new believer, it was so, so very powerful. So thank you again for singing those songs for us, and thank you, Nicole, for reading that scripture for us. That's the scripture we're going to be looking at. As we enter into the Christmas season, we're going to be doing a few messages on the Christmas story, <clears throat> but for this morning, we're going to do a message from the prophets related to the birth of the Messiah. And I call the message this morning the Christmas program, and we're going to see why that is in a few moments. <clears throat> Collins English Dictionary often does the word of the year, <clears throat> and the word of the year reflects the preoccupations of the time. <clears throat> and as people across the globe uh, reel from one crisis to the next, the <clears throat> Colin, Collins English Dictionary revealed the word of the year for, not 2023, but I want to focus on the word of the year for 2022. <clears throat> and that word is permacrisis. <clears throat> and Collins Dictionary defines permacrisis as an extended period of instability and insecurity especially one resulting from a series of catastrophic events. <clears throat> and I think that word pretty much sums up just how awful the last few years have been for so many of us. <clears throat> Due to the COVID crisis, the war in Ukraine, now the war in Israel, <clears throat> political chaos, the surging cost of living, these are the things we've witnessed over the last three years. <clears throat> One blogger wrote that the term permacrisis embodies the dizzying sense of lurching from one unprecedented event to another. As people <clears throat> wonder how, well, what new horrors might be around the corner. And that is the world that we are living in today. But what we're going to see is God has an answer for a world in permacrisis. <clears throat> what we're going to learn this morning is that 2,000 years ago, the Lord put into motion a rescue mission for all of humanity <clears throat> in what I call the Christmas program. It is about the Lord Jesus on a mission to fulfill God's plan for the nations. And it begins with the birth of Christ Jesus in Bethlehem. <clears throat> and it ends with peace on earth from the city of Jerusalem. Now Christmas is not a standalone event, but marks the start of a global plan that God is working out in history. And Micah, the prophecy that we're going to be looking at this morning, he describes four events in this divine program. Four phases in the Christmas program that God has put in place. And the first event takes place in Bethlehem. So please turn with me to Micah. And we're going to start at verses 2 and work our way down to verse 5, the very <clears throat> first part of verse 5. It says, But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His going forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Now I want you to imagine for a moment that you own a few maps of Parkland County. And as you look over the maps, you notice places like Fallis and Carvel and Tomahawk and a few other villages or other towns, but one place is missing on your maps and it troubles you. <clears throat> and none of the Parkland maps that you own has Beach Corner on it. Now, can you imagine? 
No, Beach Corner, the creators of the map, did not think Beach Corner was significant enough to include. Well, I share that because in ancient Israel, <clears throat> the village of Bethlehem never appeared on the maps of any lists of towns in Judah. <clears throat> For instance, if you go to Joshua 15, we find a long list of 114 Judean towns and villages. And Bethlehem is not on the list. And then we go to the book of Nehemiah and we find a more recent list of towns and villages in Judah. Bethlehem is not on the list. From a human standpoint, Bethlehem was not important. <clears throat> but from God's standpoint, it was the place to begin his program of peace on earth. You see, the Lord chose the most obscure place to put in motion his most significant plan. And the word Bethlehem means house of bread. Beth is the Hebrew for house. Lechem, lechem, lechem sorry, is the word for bread. And the greatest inhabitant of this obscure village said, I am the bread of life. The living bread was born in the house of bread. Now there are two Bethlehems in ancient Israel, <clears throat> one in the Galilee region up in Zebulun area, and the other in Judah. And so Micah adds the word Ephrathah so we would know which of the two Bethlehems he is talking about. <clears throat> Ephrathah, in fact, is another name for Bethlehem. If you turn with me to Genesis chapter 48, verse 7, we see that. <clears throat> Here Jacob is talking to his children, <clears throat> and he says, Now as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died to my sorrow. In the land of Canaan on the journey, when there was still some distance to go to Ephrath. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. And so Ephrathah means fruitful. Bethlehem, Ephrathah then means a fruitful house of bread. And so this tells us that the living bread, the Lord Jesus, who <clears throat> came down from heaven and brought forth much fruit, this living bread will be born in the fruitful house of bread. <clears throat> Just a little more about Bethlehem. Ephrathah has an interesting history. As we just read, <clears throat> Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel, was buried there. And then the events of the book of Ruth took place in Bethlehem. King David was born in this insignificant place. And Micah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, points to a significant future for this insignificant village. 700 years after this prophecy, God entered Bethlehem in the person of Christ Jesus to begin his global rescue mission. So this little town of Bethlehem, Bethlehem has now become the most important town in the world. And I believe this <clears throat> shows us a vital principle that is retold over and over again throughout the pages of Scripture. And the principle is this. The Lord chooses weak things. He uses insignificant places. He works through obscure people to carry out his plan and purposes. <clears throat> In effect, if we could paraphrase what Micah is saying, he's saying don't look to Jerusalem to witness the start of God's mission. Look to Bethlehem. In the same way, 
We don't have to look to Washington or Moscow or Ottawa or Beijing to see the Lord at work. He is at work in a major way right here in the Parkland County, right here in Spruce Grove, right here in Parkland Baptist Church. And the coming of Jesus is in accord with the eternal plan of God. He did not come to serve himself. He came to serve his father. He came to do the will of God, as we read about in another prophecy in, in Psalms 40, verses 7 and 8. This is referring to Jesus. It said, Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. We find prophecies of Jesus throughout the Old Testament scriptures. In Micah, as we see, in Isaiah, even in the Torah. And then it says in verse 8, I delight to do your will, O my God, your laws within my heart. He was not saying, oh, shucks, I guess I'll have to do your will. I'd prefer to do something else, but I'll do your will. No, it was his delight. It was his desire to do the will of God. And so his birth in Bethlehem was not the start of his existence. The Son of God had no beginning since he existed from eternity, as it says, his goings forth are from long of old, from the days of eternity. <clears throat> but when he entered human history, the Son of God added humanity to his deity. The Lord Jesus took upon himself a human body so that he could carry out God's plan for a lost world, as it says in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God, and he was in the beginning with God. And so here in Micah, in this prophecy, Micah lays out a four-phase program the Lord put into place to bring about peace on earth. <clears throat> and it begins with the first Christmas, with his incarnation, when Jesus stepped out of eternity and into human history in a little town called Bethlehem. And yet, as we look around this world, there is no peace. We live in a world that is in permacrisis. Does that mean God's mission failed? Did his mission fail? Well, there is no peace on earth because we have not reached the last stage of the program. <clears throat> and so the second event or the second phase in the Christmas Program is found in verse 3 where it says, Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has born a child. Then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. You see, after the birth of the child in Bethlehem comes the chastening of Israel. God disciplined Israel by exiling the Jewish people into Gentile lands. That's what it means when it says he will give them up until the time. And this happened 70 years after the Bethlehem event when the Romans conquered Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and dispersed the Jewish people to the ends of the earth where they would live in hardship among hostile nations. That is the second <clears throat> event or the second phase of the Christmas program. And this exile, this period of exile, will continue until the time, as it says in verse 3, when she who is in labor has born a child. What does this phrase mean? When she who is in labor is born a child. There are three interpretations 
that I come across for this verse, <clears throat> but for the sake of time, I will describe one view which I believe makes the most sense. The she here in this passage is the land of Israel. And the child that is born is the nation or the people of Israel. <clears throat> so after almost 2,000 years of exile, God carries out stage three or phase three of the Christmas program, which is the rebirth of the nation of Israel. If we go to Isaiah chapter 66, very interesting prophecy that we read about. In verse 7 of Isaiah 66, Before she travailed, as she again be in the land, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she gave birth to a boy. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Can a land be born in one day? Can a nation be brought forth all at once? As soon as Zion travailed, she also brought forth her sons. And I believe this passage accurately describes what happened on May 14 of 1948 when the Jewish people declared independence for Israel as a united and sovereign nation for the first time after nearly 2,000 years of exile. During a 24-hour span of time, the foreign control of the land of Israel formally ceased and its independence was acknowledged by other nations. Modern Israel was literally reborn. It wasn't born for the first time. It was reborn in a single day. <clears throat> the longing for the Jewish homeland that took almost 2,000 years to fulfill ended with a vote that took just three minutes. And so God is reversing his chastening of Israel and he is regathering the Jewish people to their homeland. This too is part of the Christmas program. And so the quest toward peace on earth <clears throat> involves the birth of Jesus in the town of Bethlehem. That's phase one. Phase two, it involves the scattering and the regathering of the Jewish people. Phase two and three, to their historic land. And the last event in the Christmas program is yet to be fulfilled. And that is the return of King Messiah, who will shepherd his people into shalom. Shalom means peace, into well-being. And he will do that from the eternal city of Jerusalem. And this will bring an end to the perma-crisis that characterizes the world in which we live. In verses 4 and 5 it says, And he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord is God and they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth this one will be our peace and so the blessings of his messianic reign will extend beyond beyond the borders of Israel to include all the nations He will conduct his activities in the power and strength of God. By shepherding his people in the power and strength of God, he will extend peace on earth. He will make everything as it ought to be, especially in matters of relationship. He will remove the hostility between nations, between people. The messianic king will be peace and he will bring peace. 
And so the Christmas program begins in Bethlehem and ends in Jerusalem. It begins with the birth of the Savior and ends with the bestowal of shalom on earth. But the question is then, how are we to live as we wait for the physical and bodily return of the Lord Jesus? How are we to live as we anticipate phase four of the Christmas program? How do we live in a world that is in permacrisis? <clears throat> well, the amazing truth to, about God's global peace plan is that we don't have to wait until he returns to enjoy his shalom, to enjoy his peace. We can have his peace even now. And we have this peace, the peace that he alone gives, his own peace, as we invite him to rule in our hearts as Messiah King. And incidentally, the way that we would invite the Lord Jesus into our hearts so that he might bring his peace into our lives is by admitting that we are sinners in need of a Savior. By believing that Jesus died for our sins and rose again on the third day. And finally, by calling on him, asking him to come into our lives. That is how we can experience his peace. And our shalom, our peace, is found in his role as our shepherd. As it says, he will arise and shepherd his flock. If we let him, the Lord Jesus will shepherd our souls. And as our shepherd, he is devoted to our well-being. That's what shalom means. That's what peace means. It's not just the, the cessation or the, the end of hostilities. It also means our well-being in all aspects of our lives. And how does the Lord shepherd us? How does he bring about our well-being? Well, if we go to Ezekiel 34, <clears throat> this is a chapter on the shepherd, the great shepherd. Verses 15 and 16, it says, I, the shepherd, will feed my flock and I will lead them to rest. I will lead them into shalom, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the scattered. I will bind up the broken and strengthen the sick. And so we see that the Lord shepherds us by feeding us. He feeds us with every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This is exactly what Jesus said when he was tempted in the wilderness to turn rock into bread. And he said to the Satan, man does not live by bread alone but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so the Lord shepherds us by feeding us, feeding us his word. And the second way that he shepherds us is by restoring us. <clears throat> I used to have a car that had a terrible wheel alignment. So you're driving down the highway and it's constantly trying to veer you off the, off the road and I constantly have to keep the steering wheel going the opposite way to stay on path. And I share this because that's exactly like us. We constantly veer off path. That's what sin means, to miss the mark. Or transgression means to, to veer off. You know, a few years ago when we lived in this obscure village in Alberta called Carbon, some of you may know where that is, <clears throat> it was a very snowy night <clears throat> and I was having a difficult time negotiating where I was supposed to turn off and I turned off the right road, but I ended up in the ditch. <clears throat> Thankfully, I had my cell phone, and I phoned my good friend who lived nearby, and I asked him to come and rescue this helpless sheep that was stuck in the ditch, and he brought his tractor over, hooked it up, and pulled me out. He was a shepherd to me at that point. He rescued me and restored me. You see, we constantly stray off course in our journey through life. <clears throat> we are driven off course by 
trials, by temptations, by crises, by circumstances of life, by sin, and all sorts of things. And as our shepherd, <clears throat> the Lord Jesus comes to us and brings us back to a place of safety. He brings us into shalom, to a place of refuge, away <clears throat> from the dangers of darkness. There's a verse in Psalm 119, the very last verse, 176. It says, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant. And that's exactly what the Lord does as a shepherd. <clears throat> the Lord shepherds us by feeding us, feeding us the word of God. He shepherds us by restoring us, by bringing us back to a place of shalom. And then thirdly, he shepherds us by healing us. <clears throat> healing our spiritual wounds that we encounter in our journey through life. <clears throat> the entanglements of sin wound us, afflictions, failed relationships, torments from the enemy of our souls, all these wound our spirits. <clears throat> and in the strength of the Lord, the Lord Jesus, our great shepherd, tends to our wounds regardless of how they happen. <clears throat> like a doctor who treats broken bones, the Lord Jesus comes to us in the grace of God and in the power of God to mend our souls and heal our wounds. If I break a leg and I go to the doctor and he asks how it happens or she asks how it happens and I say because I was being an idiot and I fell off a tree, the branch broke or whatever, he doesn't say, well, sucks to be you, I'm not going to heal your wound. They don't worry about the cause of the problem. They still are committed to healing, and that's the same with the Lord. He tends to our wounds regardless of how they happen. In Psalm 103, verse 3, it says, He, the Lord, who pardons all your iniquities and heals all your diseases. The Lord Jesus shepherds our soul with the word of God and in the grace and power of God. And so in conclusion, two things I want us to consider. <clears throat> the first thing is this. Out of insignificance comes greatness. Think about how we all started. Every one of us in this sanctuary, every one of those listening online, we all started the same way. Started as a small little microscopic zygote in our mother's womb. Insignificant, small beginnings. And yet, over time, <clears throat> this zygote develops and matures and grows. And then nine months later, we have a fully formed baby. There's a passage in Zechariah that says, do not despise the day of small beginnings. That's how God works. He starts with insignificant beginnings and builds it into greatness. And so you may feel that you live in an insignificant place. You may feel that you yourself have no significance. You may feel you attend an obscure church. You may feel that you have nothing to offer. <clears throat> but what we are seeing is nothing is ins insignificant to God. Parkland County is not insignificant. Parkland Baptist Church is not insignificant. And you are not insignificant to God. It is through obscurity that God's great purposes move forward. And so be assured that God has big plans for insignificant places. He has big plans for obscure people like you and like me. 
And so out of insignificance comes greatness. The second thing I want us to take away is that his shepherding leads you into his shalom. His shepherding leads you into his well-being. But here's the thing. His role as shepherd requires that we let him rule our life. If he is to be a shepherd, then we need to be sheep. And that means we need to be dependent on him. We need to give him control of our life. And then the shepherd of our souls will lead us into well-being in every aspect of our lives. And so the Christmas program is God's answer to the permacrisis of this world. And the Christmas program is God's answer to the permacrisis even in our own lives. And it begins with the birth of the child who also had an insignificant beginning in his mother's womb. And it began in the obscure village of Bethlehem. And it continues as he shepherds obscure people like you and me. And it finally ends with global peace when he returns to the city of Jerusalem and establishes peace on earth. Why don't we pray, Lord, we thank you so much for <clears throat> this rescue mission that you have put in place so many years ago. You were born in an obscure village and yet you brought about a worldwide plan and my prayer Lord for every one of us here is that we would recognize that you do not despise small beginnings you do not despise obscure places or obscure people but it is through such things that you work out your great plan and I would ask, Lord Jesus, that for every one of us here, that you would use us, that you would work out your plan and purposes not only in us, but through us, that we would be salt and light in this world, a world that is indeed in permacrisis, that we would be your peace bearers, bringing shalom to those we come in contact with, and not only that, Lord, but we would also be sheep, having a posture of dependence on you so that you might shepherd us, shepherd our souls with the word of God, in the grace of God, in the power of God. Help us, Lord, to surrender to you so that we might be shepherded by you and experience your well-being, your peace, your shalom in our lives. And if there is anyone here, Lord, in this sanctuary or listening online who doesn't know you as shepherd, as Lord, as Savior, <clears throat> I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would work in their hearts, in their minds, convicting them of their sin and to repentance, convincing them of their need for your righteousness, even unto faith, and that they would call on you for salvation, and that you would come and live in their hearts as Lord, as Savior, as Shepherd. Father, we thank you so much for all that you have done, all that you're doing, and all that you are doing, and Lord, we do pray for your return. This world is in a mess. Even as we see all these crazy protests, 
in cities and universities across the Western civilization, calling out for the destruction of the Jewish people. We know when that happens, we are in trouble. And so, Father, we do pray that you would bring peace to this world in crisis and use us as your ambassadors in this process. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.